This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone wherever you are. First of all, thank you so much for attending this online session in Buffer Cash, a deep drive by Aman Sarma. On behalf of Nepal Oracle user group, I would like to thank Aman a lot for accepting our invitation. This session will be quite interesting and very useful because Buffer Cache, uh, also known as a database Buffer Cache, is a core component of Oracle Database Architecture. Oracle Database has evolved a lot with the time. There are a lot of changes, improvement made to Buffer Cache also. Buffer Cache for Oracle Database version 8i is definitely different from Buffer Cache for 19c. So we must have a deep knowledge about the database buffer cache to make database performance optimal. Aman is an active speaker, Oracle database consultant and Oracle instructor. He has been working with Oracle database for over a decade. His main focus is to understand how Oracle database works internally. Beside uh, Oracle database, he has a very strong knowledge of Linux, Solaris, Oracle Real Application Cluster, Data Guard, Rman, Exadata, and Oracle Enterprise Manager. In 2010, he was awarded with the prestigious Oracle Ace Award from Oracle Corporation. And as usual, I would like to humbly request everyone to stay mute till the end of the session. Uh, if you have any question, you may raise your question by text in the chat section anytime and we will grab them and reply at the end of the session during q a and in the same way i request everyone to fill up the feedback form we will post feedback from url in the chat window and lastly considering the current scenario we would like to request everyone to stay at home stay safe take care of you and your family now without further ado i would like to hand over control to aman aman will start with his introduction and exciting webinar. Okay, Aman, 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 Aman. Okay, Aman, it all is. Thanks, thanks, Ali. Uh, can you see my slide? Yep. Yep. Okay, okay. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks Nepal Oracle user group for having me and for organizing this webinar. And thanks to all the attendees uh, from wherever you're connecting from. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. And uh, Dili already has introduced me. Uh, I have been working with Oracle database for quite some time and I have been actually uh, working with the Oracle database uh, internals. I uh, basically like to explore the Oracle database internals a lot. And this presentation is basically based about the same uh, you know, aspect. So there are a lot of times we do hear uh, about database memory structures like buffer cache, shared pool, and so forth. And there are going to be uh, some aspects about these memory structures, which are many times explained in a very simple manner. So this presentation was actually originated from the idea that uh, certain things are not really that simple. They are a little bit more complex and probably the idea of this presentation is that after this presentation is over, you should be having more detailed information about buffer cache, at least as much detail as we can put in one hour for, uh, you, know, for you. So uh, this is about me. I have been working with the Oracle for about uh, close to 15 plus years now. I'm an Oracle ace. I am the member of uh, All India Oracle User Group. I am the founder and the lead of the North India chapter of AIOUG. I tweet here, I blog here, and I am the co-author of uh, two books on the database backup and recovery. Now, this presentation is basically going to be about my own understandings. So this is very, very important, actually, that you should actually take whatever I say with a grain of salt. And the reason for that basically is that uh, these particular things, they are actually going to be my tests. 
So of course they can change uh, with the versions. They are possibly going to be different in different versions or they probably are going to be different when you're going to be working with uh, different hardware. So you do actually check it out, uh, you know, whenever you're going to be playing around with these things that versions and hardware, they actually do actually make an impact. Now, this is basically what we are actually going to be covering. So uh, buffer cache and some more about buffer cache, uh, about the tuning aspects, and also, you know, we'll take some time for the QA. Now, the buffer cache is basically the part of the Oracle instance. And obviously, uh, the Oracle instance is actually, you know, comprised of many, many things. So definitely uh, Oracle instance has many memory structures. Buffer cache is definitely one of them. And buffer cache is actually going to play a huge role by getting the data uh, selected from your disk. And obviously a golden rule in the uh, computer world or in the database world is anything accessed from the disk is actually going to be considered slower and anything accessed from the memory is actually considered to be faster. Oracle instance, basically serves as a bridge between you and the database, the physical database. And obviously, if you have the data available, uh, you know, for the next time access or the second time access for you from the buffer cache, it does improve the performance. And that's basically what the idea of each of these memory structures actually are. Of course, we have other components available like, you know, listener and so forth, and they are basically going to be there. Now, one thing which is actually going to be about the Oracle database is that everything which we actually do in terms of the Oracle database uh, you know, environment, it is based upon the Oracle database kernel. And in the Oracle database kernel, we have different layers for different functionalities. The buffer cache is actually one particular you know, aspect of the Oracle database, which also is linked with one of such layers. So here is a list of uh, those particular layers which actually work behind the scene or which basically work in the system. And you can notice actually that the buffer cache is basically based out of something called the kernel cache layer. Now, there are many different layers. For example, when you talk about transactions, transactions actually are managed by the kernel transaction layer. Uh, for example, if you're going to be managing your uh, shared pool, it is going to be managed by another layer so on and so forth. But buffer cache is actually going to be maintained through the kernel cache layer. And that actually makes one thing easier for us if you are looking for internals, that the buffer cache internals are going to be maintained or going to be available within those X dollar or internal tables, which actually do have the introduction of your particular uh, kernel layer of kernel cache. And Basically, what is going to be those particular tables, we'll see them just in a minute. But quickly about buffer cache is that buffer cache is nothing but it is actually a memory area where you're basically going to store data blocks accessed from the disk. It does provide you the mechanism for doing the IOs, the logical IOs, which could be of two types, which are basically going to be uh, consistent and concurrent. Buffer cache supports the cache fusion aspect of the RAC and buffer cache is primarily going to be used for multi versioning support, which means if you are going to be having one buffer and that buffer gets modified, uh, there are going to be options available within the buffer cache to support the read consistency for the other users by creating, you know, different types of buffers which actually are going to be available, uh, you know, for those users which actually are going to access your data in a consistent manner. Almost every area or almost every structure of the Oracle database layers are circular. These buffer cache is not actually any exception. It is also going to be a circular cache and it is maintained by, you know, in an oversimplified way mentioned as LRU algorithm. Now we are going to discuss the LRU algorithm in this, in this pre presentation and we're going to see that it is not actually the LRU algorithm. It is a little bit more complex than that. And buffer cache is also going to be something which uses the checkpointing mechanism to actually have you recover your database if in case you're going to be having the uh, instance recovery required. Now, 
logical IOs, which are basically going to be happening, these are going to be served from the buffer cache, obviously because buffer cache is actually going to be uh, you know the part of your uh, database instance to store the data. Now there are two types of IOs which actually do uh, happen from the buffer cache. One is a consistent set of IOs and one is the current IOs. These things possibly may look like a refresher for most of the people because actually they are. We're going to talk about the uh, deep internals just in a minute. So Current reads are basically those reads which are actually going to be for those particular reads which are requiring the current version of the block. And usually the current version is requested by your DMLs. Obviously, if you are going to modify your particular block, like the block is going to contain 100 and now you have modified it to 200. In case you want to modify that particular value again, you will not read 100. You will actually want to read 200 because that is the changed information. That is the most current read information. So only one current version of the block actually does exist in your particular buffer cache. And obviously that particular image is going to be modifiable for your future DMLs. Now, this is going to be something which is actually used by uh, Oracle kernel to create the CR buffer. So this current version of the block is going to qualify for your dirty block. And this CR version of the block is going to be qualifying for your consistent read. So consistent read is basically going to be created because in Oracle database, the transaction isolation level is actually set to read committed. And what does that mean? Basically, anyone who is willing to read the data from the buffer cache, they only can read the data, which is actually going to be uh, available to you as a consistent data. Now, in case it is a consistent data, it means it has to be available from the last commit. And to make it possible for those particular buffers, which are actually not yet committed, but are dirty, Oracle creates this particular CR image by applying the undo data or undo image over to a, a free buffer based upon the SCN, which are, you are going to be requesting in your query. There are possibilities to have multiple set of such CR, ver CR version of the blocks being created. And there is going to be a parameter which actually controls that these particular uh, CR copies are not actually going to be pushed back to the disk. Obviously, they are not needed because we do not really need them uh, once the read is actually going to be over and once the block is actually going to be committed. The final version of the block, which is supposedly going to be available to us, is the newest modified block with the uh, commit issued for it. Now, if you do want to trace these particular, uh, you know, IOs, you actually can use these two trace events, 10200 and 10201, uh, which is, if you remember, is similar to what we actually have in the other parts of the uh, tracing, like most famous ones are uh, 10053 and 46. So this is also going to be two trace events, which you actually can use basically for your uh, consistent read tracing. Now, buffer cache, in terms of the old environments, or when I say old, it means before the 9i, actually was maintained differently. Uh, this is again just a refresher, but should be helpful in order to understand the changes which have happened now. So previously, the buffer cache actually was actually a singular you know, area. It was actually one single structure, which was basically there. And this single structure actually was comprising of two structures inside further. So there was one buffer cache, which basically gave also the size to keep and the recycle. So the standard cache basically was your database buffers cache, and that was used for the data access all the time. Then we had the keep cache, which basically was used to uh, store the data for a longer period of time, and the recycle cache, which basically was available to throw away the data as soon as the uh, uh, you know data was not required. Now, this was static. We were basically not able to get dynamically modified, and uh, this actually did change from 9i onwards. Now, from 9i onwards, first of all, these areas actually have been uh, made separate or singular. Now, each particular area is actually going to be available as a separate area or as an uh, individual area. Default is still going to be default cache 
which is going to be now dynamic in nature and it is actually going to be not giving the memory to keep and recycle as it was giving in the previous versions. So now when you allocate the default cache, it remains as its own. There is going to be a separate keep cache and recycle cache which does need the uh, memory setting available to them or given to them. Now, unlike the allocations done with the help of DB block buffers in terms of the previous versions, now the memory management of buffer cache or as a matter of fact, any area within the Oracle database instance is done with the help of the static chunks or static units of memory called granules. We're gonna talk about granules just in a minute. So granules basically are going to be now which are going to allocate the uh, memory allocation for you in terms of the buffer cache. And of course, as I mentioned, it is uh, dynamic in nature. And that means you basically have the buffer cache uh, modifiable even when the instance is actually running. Uh, it is maintained by these parameters. Of course, the default block size or the unit of IO is actually going to be DB block size, which is set to 8 KB still. Uh, you definitely do have the parameters to control uh, the buffer pools and you do have also the buffer cache available if in case you want to use the non-default block sizes. So non-default block sizes just in passing are not meant for uh, basically improving the performance. That can be a side effect of that but non-default block sizes are basically meant for transportable uh, table space. And in case you're going to be using a non-default block size, you actually are supposedly going to use the non-default cache as well. So if you're using a 8K as a default block size, you are supposedly going to be using the standard cache. But if you're going to be creating a table space of 16K, then you do need to use DB16K as the cache size. Now, these particular buffer structures are basically created in terms of something called the buffer pools and these basically are going to be available to you to set in terms of your create command or in terms of your alter command for either a table or an index that means that is how you can actually tell that whether your particular system is going to be using what so if you're going to be using a keep cache Keep cache is basically going to be a part of your DB keep cache parameter. And this is usually required because you want to keep your objects or the objects data for a longer period of time. This is not a part of your auto tuned mechanisms. And this is also going to be using the LRU. So it means even in the keep cache, the buffers are not actually kept for infinite period of time. That means it is not actually true. Even there is a cache clause which is going to come almost at the end of the presentation. Even that does not cache your data permanently. But keep cache actually is going to be something which you can use for those objects which you are going to access more frequently uh, and you do not want to actually put those objects in terms of your uh, default cache. If there are objects which are not accessed by you uh, very often and you do not want to again crowd those objects in your default cache, for that purpose, we have the recycle cache, which is basically going to be controlled by its own parameter. And about one third of the objects only are going to be kept in this recycle pool, which means as soon as you access the data from this recycle cache, immediately the data gets flushed out. So in case we talk about uh, hit ratio, that is basically how much data actually gets accessed from the particular you know, buffer cache or from the particular uh, keep cache or recycle cache, you will always see the hit ratio being extremely low for the recycle cache, which is quite justifiable. Obviously, in case you're going to be having the NK caches, they are basically going to be for the non-default buffer pools. Like I said, they are basically meant for transportable table spaces. Now, I mentioned to you that in terms of 9i version onwards, Oracle basically created a memory chunk, a static memory chunk or a fixed sized memory chunk called granule. So granule is basically going to be the structure using which you are actually going to be having your particular memory allocated in terms of your environments. Again, like I said, it is maintained through also by the kernel layer. So KSM is the kernel service memory layer, which is actually going to be managing it. And the granule size is based upon your SGA size. 
So depending upon the SGA being uh, what size, the GNU chunk size is going to vary between 4 megabytes to 16 megabytes. And it is actually going to be something which is now used to allocate the memory for your database structures. So in case you are going to allocate, for example, uh, 11 megabyte for the buffer cache, because it is the chunk size of four, the number of chunks allocated are going to be three, which is going to make not the 11 megabyte, but it is actually going to be making 12 megabyte. Now, there are allocations possible in terms of complete, partial, uh, or immediate that depends on the command which you're going to be using. But in general, the granule is actually going to be available to you for every component within the particular system. So what this query is supposedly going to show you which component you're actually having and then what granule type is actually being there. And we will actually see also by this query the particular granules being uh, available to that component. That means the link of the granules being available to that particular component. Now you can see the uh, output of that coming up over here. So shared pool, large pool, Java pool, default cache. So there is a link, which is link list, I would say, which is actually created. And this link list is basically going to be holding the previous, the next, and also the granule, uh, you know, allocated to the particular, you know, structure. Again, granule is basically going to be a unit that means it is going to hold the information which is going to be required to make up that particular memory area. And this is basically what the granule for the buffer cache actually is going to hold. So you do notice granule itself has a management header, which is basically going to be the header that you do actually have in terms of your system. So you do notice that there is a granule header. Then the granule is going to hold the information for the blocks, which it is actually going to be caching in. Now, for a data block, there is going to be a block header. So usually when we talk about a particular data block, a data block is basically going to be having a header of its own. So if, if you try to say, if this is a block actually, a block is going to be having its own header and then some free space and then some used space. This header is actually called as a generic header. It is not the only header. There are a few more headers above that. But this particular header is actually what we consider as the block header. Now, these blocks which are accessed from your disk to maintain their information there is a memory component created, which is actually called the buffer header, which is basically exposed in a table called X dollar BH. So it is going to be sort of like there is a block and that block is basically going to be maintained by a block header. So what we actually load in the block header is not the data of the block, but the metadata for the block. So you actually do notice that in terms of the particular uh, structure, you basically have these particular things of the block header and the buffer header maintained. So this is what is going to be the array of the data buffers. And then you do have the array of the uh, buffer headers, which are basically maintained. So each granule is basically going to be holding such information since it is a much larger structure as compared to a standard uh, block, which is just 8 KB. So definitely one granule actually can hold the information of more than one particular uh, you know, data block. Now, the buffer cache is maintained in terms of the architecture part, or you can say in terms of the structure part with the help of a hash table. Now, this hashing mechanism is almost similar everywhere in terms of the Oracle database for different structures, but uh, the internal components could be actually different. In terms of the buffer cache, the uh, hash table is basically going to be holding up the information of blocks maintained with the help of something called DBA, which is data block address. Data block address is basically a 22 byte number, basically comprising of two things inside a table space number and a block number. So when you actually access a block for that particular block, a number is created, that is DBA, and based upon that, the hashing is actually going to be generated. Now, these particular numbers are actually going to be uh, maintained with the hashing, that means with a key value pair in the hash buckets. And within the hash buckets, they hung around using something called hash chain. So take it like, you know, you have a string of 
uh, you know, you have a string actually which is available. So this string is basically going to be having your buffers actually hung over them. And each of this string is basically going to be available in the hash bucket. And this hash bucket is basically going to be having a key value pair to actually tell that whether your buffer should actually belong over here or not. Now, these particular structures are basically going to be available to you for your particular entire cache. And obviously, the buffers of one object are going to be holed up in this particular uh, you know, hash chain. Now, they are basically going to be the one which are going to be used for the buffer replacement. And for that, there is going to be an LRU algorithm which is going to be in place. And obviously, this is going to be maintained by latches, just like anything in the Oracle database. Uh, even the buffer cache is maintained by latches. So there are two latches which are actually used by Oracle for maintaining the buffer cache. One is CB LRU chain latch and another one is CBC, which is the cache buffer chain latch. So the second one is basically used to access the data from the buffer cache and the first one is used to load the data in the buffer cache. Now, the hash buckets, as I said, are basically going to be there and they are going to be used basically by you to find out that whether your particular buffer requested by you is actually available in the system or not. Now, they are going to be maintained internally, but the parameter to uh, control them is going to be DB block hash buckets. And each bucket, as I said, is going to be having a set of chains available inside it to hold up the particular buffers. So this is how it is sort of going to look like. So you have a buffer cache, which is having many, many buffers inside. Now, these buffers are going to be holed up in terms of a hash buckets table. This hash bucket table is going to be having the hash chains actually available you know, for you. And you do notice that within the hash chains, the buffer headers basically are actually available. If you do have created the CR copies for your particular buffers, they are going to be available also. And these particular buffers or these particular buckets are contained or managed by the CBC latches to actually access the data. Now, if you do notice that these particular latches are actually available to you in terms of one to N configuration, that means one latch is basically managing more than one hash bucket area. Again, this is done now, uh, you know, from the previous versions, the, you, earlier we had a latch holding up or managing just one particular, you know, bucket, but now obviously to save the, uh, you know, memory and to make it more, you know, better accessible, or you can say more better optimized, one latch is now going to manage more than one bucket. Now the number of buckets, as well as the number of uh, latches, they are internally created uh, from a long time ago, but they are still manageable for you in terms of the part of uh, DB block hash latches for the CBC latches and DB block hash buckets for the buckets. Now, within the buffer cache, there are going to be a few more areas which actually do work to get the buffer cache created. And one of them is going to be the buffer pools. Now, buffer pools basically are the pools which actually hold up your entire caches. So you do have the same available in terms of the public view, for example, default, keep, and so forth. And definitely you're going to be having the non-default as well. But buffer pool is basically going to be a structure which actually holds up your buffer header. So you do notice that each buffer pool is basically going to be having a header and they are exposed in terms of the public views like buffer pool and buffer pool statistics, but they are actually maintained by the particular uh, internal table, extoller KCB WBPD, which basically stands for kernel cache, if I actually just type it out over here. So it is basically going to be the kernel cache uh, buffer work area buffer pool descriptor. So this is basically the structure which actually holds up the information of your uh, buffer pool. Now, within the buffer pool, we actually have the granules we already have talked about, and we also have something called work area set. So this W stands for the work area set. Take it like this, that each particular buffer cache is divided logically further into smaller caches. 
and each of this smaller cache is basically one particular work area right and this is basically what we're actually seeing or going to see just in a minute so let me, yeah so basically you notice that within the buffer pool you have the granules loaded each of the structure is basically going to be maintained by different work areas. What we're trying to show basically here, one particular buffer pool is basically having four work areas created. Now, how many of them are actually going to be possible? That is based upon uh, you know CPU count. And each of this work area is going to be written by your DB writers. So when you say that there is a DB writer and when you say that DB writer may actually have a problem, it could be that you have many work area sets created and there is only one DB writer. Now you can notice that here we are trying to show that DB writers basically are going to be working with their work area sets. And from there, they're basically going to be loading the data or sorry, writing the data into the disk. Now, we also discussed that these particular buffer pools are basically going to be having the buffer header. So what exactly is a buffer header? Like I said, they are basically going to be the structures within the memory itself. And they are meta structures, which means they are not actually about the data within the block. So they're not about that you're loading up an employee's table or a department's table. They are basically about the buffer which you are trying to load in the buffer cache. So when you say that a buffer is flushed out of the buffer cache or it is loaded in the buffer cache, the information of that particular uh, activity is done with the help of these particular buffer headers. And they are the ones which are basically are you know attached or detached from your buffer cache hash chains. Obviously, they are the one which do make up your particular uh, you know, LRU mechanism as well. And when we say that a buffer is dirty or something, that information also is maintained by the buffer header. Now, uh, they are actually the one which are exposed for you in terms of the X dollar BH, which is X dollar buffer header or V dollar BH, which is the same public view. But buffer headers are not actually the block headers because as they already mentioned a block header will actually tell to the block which table it belongs to, uh, whether the block is actually having any kind of uh, uh, users accessing it, uh, how many rows it actually holds up, so on and so forth. On the contrary, the buffer header is about the block which it is actually going to be working for. So you do notice that in the buffer cache, we have the buffer headers actually being uh, moved around. Now, the work area set which we discussed already is basically introduced, you know, in terms of ATI. Now, basically what is actually going to be a work area set, it is going to be a division done actually within the buffer cache to actually manage it more betterly. And why it was actually done simply because if you have a very, very large buffer cache, it would be quite difficult for the Oracle systems to actually scan that large cache. So instead of doing that, it is actually possible to divide the cache logically into such work area sets and your LRU or the checkpoint queues, they are basically maintained in these particular work area sets and they are actually exposed in terms of a table called X dollar KCB WDS, which is kernel cache buffer work area descriptor set. Now I did actually find it out that they are actually based upon two multiplied by your CPU count. Again, like I said, uh, it, it possibly can change, so do check it out uh, in terms of latest versions, whether it is still the same or not, but this is based upon the CPU count nonetheless. So what is a work area set going to be? Now you notice that work area set is basically going to be a division of your default cache. And like I said already that they are basically going to be maintained by your LRU chain latches. Now the LRU chain latches are actually the latches which basically load the data from the disk to the particular uh, memory structures or you know to the buffer cache. And from here, from the work area sets, the data is going to be written by the DB writer to the disk, right? Now, since we have talked about the uh, buffer cache and we have talked about the LRU and checkpoint queue, this is a kind of discussion which I do hear a lot that a buffer cache contains a hot buffer list, a cold buffer list, and something called a dirty list. 
So basically, uh, you know, what they say that, you know, there is a buffer cache which is maintained by an LRU link list, which is having a cold end, which is having a hot end, and it is maintained by a, uh, you know, a LRU mechanism. And there is also a link list, which is actually a dirty list, and that actually maintains your dirty buffers. Though it is not totally incorrect, but what I would say that this is not entirely correct as well. Now, buffer cache link list are actually going to be available to you in terms of uh, two or three parts. So this is how these link lists actually are created. So instead of actually having something called the hot end list or the cold list actually, we do have something called a main list and something called the auxiliary list. So the main list actually is the so-called hot list and the aux list is basically your so-called cold list. If you flow, if you check out the uh, particular arrays which are basically going in, so from the hot end, the buffers are detached and attached to your cold end. If a buffer is actually going to be available to you, uh, you know, as or you know, accessed by you, then it is promoted back from the aux list to the cold list. Uh, sorry, to the hot list. And if a buffer is going to be dirty, it is going to be made dirty from the main list, and then it is going to be attached to the checkpoint queue list. There are going to be two, one where the buffer is actually going to be attached, and the second one from where the buffer is actually going to be written. So basically, uh, these are actually going to be the link list, not actually going to be the uh, hot and cold. Now, they are maintained by the LRU main chain latch, which is basically going to control that how you basically load or access these particular buffers. And they are also maintained by the parameter DB block LRU latches. Now, I mentioned to you that they are going to be available inside a work area. Since the buffer cache is divided across multiple work area sets, these link lists do exist in every work area set. So that means when you are basically going to be having a free buffer weight being reported to you, it is actually going to be meaning that Oracle could not find in any particular work area set the requested number of free buffers for you. Now, in terms of these particular link list, if you really want to see them, they are actually going to be available to you in the Xolar KCBWDS in terms of these particular columns. So they are basically not something which you do need to actually check it out, but the next replacement and previous replacement is actually going to be about the hot end and the, uh, the next replacement AX is actually going to be your auxiliary list or your cold end. Now, also these particular link lists are maintained and I did a dump of the buffer cache and you can actually notice that this dump actually does show you the particular parts which we basically just mentioned. So this is actually a dump done for the buffer cache and you actually can notice the buffer cache is mentioned for a buffer as a hot. We also have different queues which are actually there. So that means basically we do have everything existing actually in terms of the buffer cache which we just actually mentioned. Now, the LRU algorithm that is very commonly mentioned for the buffer cache is actually not just the LRU algorithm. It is more simplified name, which is commonly used for it. There are basically three algorithms which did actually exist in the buffer cache. We are currently on the third one, but basically the algorithm did start from the standard LRU. This was the first uh, LRU algorithm which did exist. And from there, the name actually became popular. So the idea basically was a simple link list was created and this did hold your particular buffers. Now this did have your particular uh, entire set of buffers being available and obviously the buffers were actually being uh, called hot and cold in terms of its both ends. Now this had a typical problem that if you're going to access a very large table that is going to sweep out the entire chain and that obviously means if the entire chain is being swept by one particular big table scan, that means even the particular uh, buffers which are required probably probably for uh, frequent access, they will also be thrown out. So that means if you're doing lots of full table scans, that possibly would actually destroy or you can say uh, disrupt this entire particular uh, environment. Now, for this reason, 
in the version 6 they actually introduced a modified LRU algorithm which basically created a small window just to access the or just to manage the uh, buffers which are accessed through the full table scan so basically the previous link list did actually change to something like this so now you do have the same link list but a small section is actually maintained by something called the full table scan window and this full table scan window was basically maintained by something called a small table threshold so small table threshold basically is still around that parameter does have uh, internal changes happening depending upon the version like usually it is two percent but in one of the versions it actually became as five percent then again got reduced to two percent of the buffer cache but basically what oracle did that in terms of this variation they managed to fit the full table scans dedicatedly in this particular fts window and anything else which is actually like a random access or a, a uh, atomic access they are basically maintained the in the other end now this did actually serve very well for them but in terms of the databases becoming larger they actually again remodified this algorithm and they introduced the final one which we are using right now which is basically called the touch count based algorithm now this is still actually going to be using your so-called the hot ends and the cold ends but instead of actually having the hot and cold end, they basically have divided your main link list into a 50% division. And that division is basically gave it the name of midpoint insertion algorithm. Now, uh, the midpoint is created by an internal parameter. And if a buffer is actually going to be larger than this particular small table threshold parameter, it is actually attached to the LRU window directly, LRU link list directly, so that it does not actually flood basically your MRU or your main list. Now, the way these buffers are considered to be hot and cold, this is tracked using something called a counter and that counter is considered as a touch counter now this touch counter is incremented every three seconds which means you need to have a three second timeout basically to have this counter incremented and this counter is basically tracked in another header of your buffer which is going to be called the cache header so there is another header called transaction header but there is a separate cache header as well and if in case you want to see these particular, uh, you know, uh, counters, actually, you can actually see them through the TCH or the touch count column in terms of your X dollar BH. So basically what is going to be happening now, your buffer cache link list or the main list is divided into two parts. One part, logically speaking, is going to hold your hot buffers and the second part is going to hold your uh, cold buffers so when a buffer is actually going to be attached it is basically going to be attached at the midpoint and from there the buffer needs to earn the right to basically get promoted as a hot buffer and that's where the algorithm is going to kick in if a buffer is actually marked as hot due to the algorithm the buffer is actually going to be artificially cooled down and if it is cooled down it is actually going to be detached from the main end and it is actually going to be attached to the uh, cold end so the idea basically is that when you're going to be having the counter incremented you need to have a three second timeout if the buffer is actually going to be having the counter higher than two or even equal to two it is promoted to the hot end or it is considered to be hot as soon as the buffer is actually considered to be hot the algorithm kicks in with the parameter db aging stay count and it is basically going to cool down that particular you know buffers counter and it will reset it to zero so basically the idea is your buffer counter is set to for example two it is marked as hot now the algorithm kicks in ages aging stage stay count kicks in the counter is now reduced to zero since it is reduced to zero now the buffer is detached from your main list and will be reattached to your uh, lru link list and in the lru link list or your cold end another parameter kicks in called cool count and now your particular buffer is going to be having the count incremented to one 
And now from here, the counter has to increment only then you're basically going to be having this particular uh you know uh, right again to become the hot buffer so you do notice that these parameters basically control this they are the, they are the default values that's why they are underlined so hot area is controlled by 50 which means this is the 50 percent division hot criteria parameter basically is set to two so that means your buffer should have the touch count of at least equal to two to basically be considered or more than two to be basically considered as hot. The buffer is cooled down to zero. And then in the LRU link list, it is actually going to be set to reset to one. The buffer will be incremented with the touch counter after the three second timeout. And the CR copies of the buffers are not actually frozen in the buffer cache, which means the CR copies are immediately flushed out as soon as the work done, uh, you know, over the particular buffer is committed. So the aging uh, freeze CR is set to false by default. You do not need to have the buffers being available in the CR copy uh, in the buffer cache. Now, these particular structures basically make it easier for you to actually uh, manage your particular structure, uh, manage your buffer cache. And also, there is going to be a possibility for you to actually have your data mentioned as the cache data, which is actually the term normally mentioned to basically ensure that we are going to be having a table cached, but unlikely uh, like the shared pool, which actually also have a similar thing called keep the tables are not permanently cached actually. So basically what does this cache clause does, if you're using it with the create table, alter table, or with the hint, it basically bypasses the midpoint and it actually promotes your buffer directly to the hot end. So this is basically what we did mention that you have a midpoint. So if there is a buffer, this buffer is accessed from the disk. This buffer basically goes from the disk and it actually goes to your particular uh, midpoint. But if you're going to use the cache clause, instead of the buffer going to the midpoint, the buffer basically goes, sorry, the buffer basically goes to your uh, uh, top end. Now, you already know that the buffer which is going to go to the top end is going to be reset by the Oracle with the parameter that we just discussed. That means the cache clause does not really cache the tables it just gives you a small leverage. Buffers are still replaceable, even though they are uh, so-called being cached. So do not think that you do actually cache the buffers by the cache clause. If you do want the buffers to be available for a longer duration, a better alternative will be actually to use the keep cache. Now, okay. Now, in terms of the 12C, to basically make the buffers uh, accessibility tracked, they basically divided the buffer cache into a small subsection, and that subsection is based on another ways of uh, maintaining the uh, buffer access, and that is the temperature. Now, this is exclusively for big tables. This is not supposedly meant for the smaller tables or the tables accessed by the random access. That means if you are using the tables like the normal table scans, you are actually better fit still to use the touch count based algorithm. But if you are going to be requiring larger scans, uh, sorry, scans done for the larger objects, which you do not actually want to crowd with your standard cache, then you can divide your buffer cache into this another subsection where the accessibility of this big table is actually going to be uh, done using a temperature. Now, the temperature is not really the temperature. It is basically a number which is assigned to your particular buffer. And that number is basically going to be starting by a value. And from there onwards, uh, 1000 was the number, which basically what I did found out as the testing. So basically from there onwards, the buffer is actually going to be promoted based upon the increment of this temperature. So this is basically how it is actually going to be done. You do need to mention a separate parameter DB big table cache percent target which can be maximum of 90% of your particular 
buffer cache obviously it should not be but you can actually do that and this does get the size from your standard cache only and to implement this you do need to have your parallel degree policy set either as to auto or as to adaptive and in case you're going to be having the objects actually accessed by this particular uh, temperature based access you actually can check it out from these particular views bt scan uh, big table scan cache and big table scan object temperatures this is something which as i said already you should only use if you are actually going to require the tables being uh, you know accessed for very large size now how does the buffer access gets looked up in a very simple way this is how it is going to be this is actually for a full table scan example oracle will search with the uh, execution plan they came to know that you need the buffer access they will look at the extent from your segment they will find out the block address from your hash chains from there the buffer uh, bucket is going to be located the hash bucket is going to be located using the cache buffer chain latch the required particular buffer is actually going to be you know uh, searched if the buffer is found you're going to be having a logical io if the buffer is not found they're going to read the buffer using a physical io and to make that particular buffer available uh, that means a free buffer available they're going to look at the lru chain latch which means in terms of tuning if you do notice the CBC chain latch or the LRU chain latch, they do represent that we have a problem in the buffer cache somewhere, right? Now, the buffer is loaded in the free buffer and it is actually going to be uh, fine. Okay, got a quick question, I think, which could be very easy to answer. See, if it does not really matter actually that your table size is what, as much the table actually can be cached that will be cached if the table size is 1 TB, how do we cache it? Well, they do not need to cache your entire 1 TB. They're basically going to cache only what is actually possible to be cached and the rest of the table is not really going to be actually in your system. So basically you are actually able to scan your table continuously and basically it is going to be available to you from the cache. So if it is a very large table unfitable to your buffer cache, it is something which is going to be given to you, for example, in parts. Right, it's not something which actually you can use uh, as a as a total cache. Okay, a 10D60. Okay, so moving on from there, uh, you basically have the tuning. Now, in terms of the tuning, basically it is not very difficult as like the shared pool. You do need to check out certain things. For example, you do need to check out your free buffer weight, whether it is happening for you or not. Any read weights which are actually happening for you or not, or do you have any uh, contentions happening for the latches? There could be a hit ratio based issue as well, but hit ratio is a marker. We'll discuss that just in a minute. The buffer busy weight also can be one thing which may actually represent that you have a problem in terms of the buffer cache. Free buffer weight is simple. We already mentioned that if you're going to read a block from the physical IO, we do need a free buffer available to us or free buffers available to us in terms of the uh, LRU main list. Now, if we do not have the particular free buffers required actually in the LRU main list, DB writer is actually being invoked without waiting for the checkpoint to occur. And it is actually being asked that you should start writing the uh, uh, you know dirty buffers as soon as possible so that we can have space available. Now, obviously it means if you do have a frequent free buffer weight being reported, that means it could be a couple of things. Maybe you have slow writing speed. You don't have enough of your uh, you know, DB writers. Maybe your speed on the storage is not actually good enough. Or maybe you have smaller uh, you know, buffer cache, which means the buffers are being replaced very, very quickly. And obviously you don't have the uh, you know, total number of free buffers enough to actually hold up your incoming uh, workload. So this is something which you do need to check out what is actually the criteria or what is actually the problem in your particular case. The read weights are basically going to be very commonly happening and commonly available. That means DB file sequential read, scatter read and parallel read. Now, they are not actually the memory based weights. They are basically the read weights happening from the disk. That means these weights basically uh, represent the amount of time spent in terms of getting the buffer accessed from the disk and then brought up to the particular buffer cache. Now, 
if these weight events are available they do not represent in general a problem because they are representing user io uh, in terms of your database activity and user io is always going to be happening which means in any database even if it is a well-tuned database these weight events do actually exist and they are pretty common actually to be available in your uh, uh, health check reports but if in case you do notice that the time for these weight events the wait time for these weight events is consistently increasing the keyword is consistent if these wait events time is consistently increasing and it is going to be increasing more than 15 milliseconds then maybe you have to check out whether are you reading additional data for example if you're reading lots of indexes which are possibly not needed by you you will definitely increase your sequential read if you're doing lots and lots of scans but they are uh, happening due to without the use of indexes they are going to be falling up into the scatter read so do notice whether you're doing any such activity without really being required full table scans are not bad but if they're happening too much probably you need to check it out why if you see if this is happening for you do check it out do try to add space into your particular system and do actually check it out that you know whether you can do some uh, storage level tuning for example adding disks basically increases the bandwidth obviously if all the things are actually taken care definitely it is actually going to be uh, you know the culprit uh, the buffer cache is going to be the culprit so maybe you can actually check it out from there and see if you can increase the buffer cache the latch contentions again are basically going to be happening due to what the work you're actually doing now if you do notice a lot of cbs allow you chain latch it actually means we are actually spending a lot of time to search for the free buffers obviously amm automatic memory management should actually take care of it but if you're not then you have to increase the buffer cache by yourself the chain latch the cbc chain latch represents that we are trying to access buffers very quickly and also repeatedly it means we have sorry we have certain objects which are basically now considered as the hot object so do actually check out v dollar segment statistics do actually check if your buffer is basically accessed very repeatedly and that table or the object is actually going to be uh, accessed very repeatedly could be possible due to legitimate reasons could be possible that maybe you're writing a loop kind of thing and accessing the table again and again depending upon uh, either way you need to check it out what can be done for it now it could be possible if everything else is taken care of it could be just the buffer cache not being uh, you know big enough again amm should actually take care of that but if you're not using amm or asmm then possibly you have to actually increase the buffer cache size by yourself or maybe uh, you know you have to just uh, check it out what is actually happening now the buffer busy weights basically are going to be happening due to a particular type of the buffer being requested there are different types of buffers existing within the particular oracle database and they actually have a category called class now you can see a representation of that being present over here uh, a class can be a data block class can be a segment header block undo header block we have the bitmap blocks. There are three bitmap blocks, first level bitmap, second level bitmap, third level bitmap. So depending upon what kind of buffers are being requested, you will actually see the buffer busy wait happening for that. That means you do need to check it out that which type of buffer eventually is in the wait. Buffer busy wait is a cumulative wait event, which means it is not actually going to be a wait event, which basically represents uh, a common problem you need to actually check it out that for what kind of buffer the weight is actually happening obviously if you're reading also you, there could be a weight being represented but now that is actually exposed in a separate weight called read by other session it is no longer being considered as a buffer busy weight buffer busy weight is actually represented by three sections the file number of the buffer the block number of the buffer and something called an ID, which is basically going to be a three digit number representing that what kind of uh, you know buffer is actually or what is the reason basically for that buffer basically getting into the weight. 
Now, besides that, this is what we are just trying to show that we are having the uh, different classes actually being there. And you can actually see in this example that data block is basically the uh, particular reason that the buffer busy weight is actually occurring. Hit ratio, uh, you know, did exist in the old versions basically to represent that whether we have a tuned database or not. But hit ratio did not really serve the purpose at least uh, all the time. Hit ratio basically is a marker that whether your buffers are accessed from the memory or not. And the hypothesis is that if the hit ratio is in high 90s or it is in 100%, which is actually what is mentioned in the instance efficiency page of your AWR, uh, it is considered to be a good thing for your database, which is okay, but hit ratio actually can be uh, having a false negative or a false positive and how it is actually possible due to your access pattern. It could be possible that you may actually access the data all the time by a full table scan. Obviously a full table scan data is not actually available to us in the system uh, all the time. That means we are basically going to see the heat ratio being dropped down. If you are going to access certain tables all the time, definitely those tables are basically going to be uh, you know available to us very frequently and they will actually increase the particular uh, hit ratio counter neither of the two actually represents that we have a database either well tuned or they are not actually tuned which means how do we use hit ratio well hit ratio is supposedly going to be used as one other factor besides what we've already discussed, like you know the weights and other such kind of things. If you see the hit ratio being consistently low and you have tuned everything which possibly could be tuned, for example, the queries or other such kind of things, then probably you do need to increase your buffer cache size. But just having the hit ratio being uh, high or low, you should not actually say that your database is actually bad or good. Hit ratio is tracked for all of your three database uh, buffer cache structures. Obviously for keep, it will be always very high. For recycle, it is going to be always low. And for default cache, it should be uh, in high 90s. But as I said, it is not really going to be a, a indication or a true indication that you are actually going to be having your database well tuned. Now, with the latest advancements in the 12C onwards, you do have an option actually to even put up your entire database in terms of your buffer cache. Again, this is controlled by two mechanisms. One is the full database caching, which is implemented automatically by the system. So Oracle will check your workload and also will check your buffer cache size. If it is accommodatable, they will possibly try to cache your entire database into the buffer cache. The second alternative to this in database, uh, sorry, full database in memory caching is this is not the in memory that we actually have in the Exadata. So do notice that it is not the same mechanism. The fourth full database caching is that you need as a DBA to execute at the mount stage, alter database fourth full database caching command. Once you do that and you access your database, uh, you know, again with the workload, data is actually now going to be starting to cached in your buffer cache. Again, the same rule is supposedly going to be there. You do need to have enough buffer cache to basically hold your data. This does not really have any other optimization unlike the column based or such kind of things of the in memory. So this is just the cache which you possibly may use for your disposal. If in case you're actually going to be requiring the uh, whole database actually put up in your particular buffer cache. Another thing which is introduced in the 18C and improved in the 19C is something called mem optimized row store. Many times and nowadays we do have lots of data being generated. And one of the reasons that a lot of data is being generated is actually going to be our devices. So we have now even our TV, even our fridge, even our mobile phones generating a lot of data. And that data is actually the one which is possibly going to be accessed and used by you continuously. Now, 18C, this particular data access in terms of read basically was available or maintained through a separate memory structure called mem optimized row store. This is a separate structure 
which we actually do have basically for maintaining this thing that if we are generating such kind of data for example in iot's and so forth it is going to be available to you with the help of an inbuilt hash index in a separate memory structure called mem optimized pool your table has to be qualified for it by using the alter table command and then say mem optimize for read and after your table is actually qualified for that you have to load this particular table into this mem optimize pool by the dbms mem optimize uh, package once it is going to be done the read is going to be very very fast because they are going to read your data or your buffers using the internally created hash index so this mem optimized pool basically have two kinds of you can say uh, structures this is basically the mem optimized pool so one part and a tiny part of it is basically going to be used for the hash index and the remaining part is actually going to be used basically for your data buffers so that means if you are going to be using a table having a primary key which is mandatory for it second your table cannot be using the deferred segment creation clause your table has to be immediately created so if in case you're using deferred segment creation which is by default this is not going to work so using the hash index immediately your table is searched or your buffer is actually searched in this particular mem optimized pool the only caveat it it is not licensed but the only caveat is this is available for exadata uh, environments on the engineer systems uh, or maybe on the cloud service environments using the extreme addition or maybe on the exadata cloud service if you are going to be on on prem or even on the uh, on prem environment you do actually have to have uh, exadata with you you cannot use this feature basically for a normal database 19c the same feature is uh, enhanced even for writing actually so if you are going to be reading the data this is available to you for 18c but if you're going to generate the data and want to store the data for example you're, you're working with big data kind of environments with a lot of data like twitter feeds for example every second uh, lots and lots of twitter feeds are actually coming database traditional cache may not actually be able to comprehend with that so in 19c there is a mem optimize for write also available so basically it is actually going to be uh, you know uh, doing your writing also in a very very fast manner again the same rule has to be there it is actually going to be available to you for your particular uh, this thing called uh, exa database systems and one thing to be mentioned that this is written in terms of the 19c in terms of batches so if there is some problem which may actually occur in terms of getting that batch written to your disk you may lose the data but you must understand this is an attempt or an endeavor actually to get your writing done more quickly we are not really interested in this particular writing to basically maintain your data uh, permanently in your system all the time because the data for which you are actually going to be using these two these two features or this feature actually they are not the data which we are going to be keeping for a uh, you know longer duration or we are going to be actually really using for a kind of a you know access which is basically going to be very important like a twitter feed even if we have missed it it does not really impact our system a lot it is not like a bank transaction which cannot be missed so this is basically an optimization added in terms of 18c and 19c uh, basically to improve your performance uh, for uh, uh, you know database uh, uh, you know access whether for read or write besides the buffer cache the only caveat is it is actually going to be based upon the extra database systems now this is what the goals should be obviously you should have enough buffer cache obviously you are supposedly going to be having this uh, particular physical ios less but better than physical ios do keep a watch at the logical ios and i think uh, you should not really have free buffer weights but if they still do exist like we said do check out your storage do check out your db writer speeds increase the db writers if you can in use a synchronous io as much as possible and obviously if you can bypass the buffer cache should do that that is what is called the direct path io so if you want actually if you actually can bypass which is done in terms of the smart scans for example try to do that as well now 
definitely buffer cache is uh, dynamic now and the size of the buffer cache and the maintenance of the buffer cache is actually rather simple compared to the other structures like shared pool for example you will not get 4031 in the buffer cache for the simple reason it is actually having a standard unit of IO which is 8 KB so the uh, management of the buffer cache is supposedly going to be done now by the AMM or ASMM but in case you want to check it out that should you increase the buffer cache or not you can use a DB cache advice which basically is enabled for you by default if you are using the parameter statistics level set to typical which is again the default value for this so by default the advisory is actually available to you and that advisory does tell you that from the current size to the 10 percent of it and then to the 200 percent of it do you actually get any benefit or not by increasing the buffer cache so do actually check this out before trying to increase the buffer cache size and um, like I said always uh, of uh, you know before that it is not going to be always the benefit coming from the increase of the buffer cache. If you're doing a lot of full table scans increasing the buffer cache predom predominantly may not actually be a very good thing to, to do. Now the final bit is actually going to be that uh, you can possibly try out some stuff like you can flush the buffer cache and see the effect and Aura debug has many many things actually to play around with the buffer cache uh, but I like to say it's a rabbit hole it's a very and it's a never ending kind of thing so if you are just going to be managing databases or your DBA to manage your buffer caches I would not recommend that but if you're interested to look into internals this is possibly going to be a step forward. So that I think brings us to the end of this presentation. Uh, I tweet here, do follow me over here. That is the fastest way to get the uh, answers if you want. And I blog here if you, in case you want to read it. And if you want to send me a mail, you can actually drop it over here. So that's the end from my side from the presentation. Thanks to everyone who joined. Thanks to Nepal Oracle User Group for having me. Dili, you're around? Yep. Thank you, Aman. Thank you for this wonderful session. And guys, we have around four to five minutes for the Q&A. Okay, so there's a quick question from attendee 60. How huge pages work with the SGA? Well, huge pages basically means that you are actually going to be having the uh, you know RAM basically divided into, it's a very simple answer, but I think uh, it should be enough. So the RAM is basically divided into something called pages. So basically the idea is that you have the pages uh, available like just imagine that you have a 1 GB RAM and you have a page of 1 KB. Again just a hypothetical example. So that 1 GB RAM is going to be converted into 1 KB or you know uh, 1048 bytes of the particular system. Now this entire page structure is going to be loaded into a page table. Now this page table is basically going to be something which is going to be checked by you in order to you know work with the system memory. The problem actually is that if you have many many pages to access this page table also you are actually going to be uh, requiring to burn the CPU. And that is basically going to be something which is actually a bad thing. That is why the concept of huge page is actually there. And this huge page concept basically means instead of having the pages created for a smaller chunks, you basically can have a very large page basically available oh, wow. or large very large page set actually being available and this is going to be something which you actually are able to use uh, you know to reduce your uh, you know this thing called cpu travel the problem with the huge page can be if you want to use amm because amm basically does what it breaks your database memory on your swap space into smaller amount of chunks which needs to be you know continuously created and destroyed so those chunks roughly are between 4 kb to uh, you know 8 kb of the size it means you are actually going to be having your memory of database actually uh, called for 4 kb but you have a page on the os ram which is actually in a very large size that is why you can't use huge page basically uh, you know work along with the amm right so i think that that is what should be the answer. Okay, let me see what there was another question with the same how direct path read works. I already explained that direct path read basically means 
you are basically going to use the PGA. You're going to load your data directly into the PGA. So the way actually it goes, you access your data from the disk, it goes to the buffer cache, then it is actually given to your PGA, and then it is actually given to you. With the direct pass read, the buffer cache is bypassed. So now your data still goes into your PGA, but directly, and that is what is called direct path read. So if you're using SQL loader with the option of direct export import with the option of direct parallel queries in extra data, even the serial queries, they basically bypass the buffer cache. Is there any parameter to control work area sets in the buffer cache? Not as far as I know. It is based upon the CPU count. It is not based upon any parameter as far as I know. Aman, uh, there is one question from Siraj, I guess. Is okay. in AMM or ASMM setting buffer cache explicitly is good practice? Is it good or not a good practice? See, it, it is basically going to be something which depends upon how you actually want to control that. AMM and ASMM both basically are going to be uh, using an internal memory uh, you know, policy module basically to understand the workload and then they generate the M1 is going to generate an advice that, okay, this is the workload coming and we do need to increase the buffer cache or we do need to decrease some other structure. Now, problem is by that time, your workload is going to require additional memory. It could be possible, you know, the advice which is generated and implemented, your workload is already over. So you may not have the memory available to you to actually get your work done, it is already completed. So normally it's a good practice to keep some size as a, as a standard size to your buffer cache, despite using the ASMM or AMM. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> okay, guys, we are done with the question. Uh, I request someone to get one last question. It sure. is from Rajesh. If server memory is given as 100 GB, how allocate to SGA? Any best practices? How would you recommend? Well, best practice is going to be you decide uh, what kind of workload you're basically doing. So if it is going to be a workload, which is actually an OLTP kind of workload, uh, normally in terms of 100 GB, you will set around around 30 GB or so, basically for your OS and the remaining, you know, the RAM, which you're actually going to be having. For example, if it is 100 GB, so 70 GB, now out of 70 GB, you set aside if it is a OLTP based workload around 80% for your SGA and around 20% for your PGA. And if it is a, a data warehouse workload, then the remaining 70 GB you use 50% for your SGA and around 50% for your PGA. Since you mentioned uh, best practice, this is what the best practice is going to be. Okay, guys, we are done with the questions. And if you have any questions left, then you can paste it in the chat window. We will reach to Aman and may, I mean, Aman may uh, reply it on the slide itself. Aman, you are going to share the <coughs> slide also, right? Yeah, I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. And thank you so much, Aman, for this wonderful session and we thanks for having me thanks that. for having me yeah. thanks for having me for the questions you can drop an email or you can post it on twitter mm -hmm. that is going to be the easiest way actually so in case anyone have any questions do actually reach me over there yes yeah, sure. okay thanks a lot okay. thanks a lot everyone thank you thank you Roman. thanks to have all the attendees weekend. thank you same with thank you thank you everyone thank you everyone and thank you Aman. Thank you. Thank you, Aman. Thank Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Aman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.